Live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and tonight we are giving you, bringing to you a menstrual equity update. And joining me in this first segment is Holly Siebold. She is the founder of Bras. Thank you so much for being here, Holly. Thank you, Catherine, for having me. So menstrual equity, a lot of people right now are saying to themselves, well, what is that? Right. <laughs> right? Right. So uh -huh. where did the term come uh -huh. from and why should we care? Right. <laughs> so actually, there's a book out right now called uh, Periods Gone Public that uh, was written by Jennifer Weiss-Wolf. And um, if people want a long explanation, uh, it's a great resource. Uh, but basically, um, she coined the term a couple years ago to describe the um, the the difference between menstruators and non-menstruators and then the the opportunities that it, that do not exist because people are um, trying to manage their period needs versus um, a non-menstruator who doesn't have to um, ha experience that those types of issues um, it's about a lack of access you know if a student at school is experiencing her period and she doesn't have access to these products well, then she's going to have to find some way to manage her period for five days every month. And so whether she's walking around the school trying to find a pad, whether she's standing in line at the clinic, she's missing class. And more so if she has to go home because she has no way to manage her period, then um, she's missing an entire day of school. And a lot of Americans think that this is a third world problem. And up until 2015, right. And that's when the aha moment came to Jennifer Weiss Wolf. And she's right. like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's, there's a lack of access to products, not just in Africa and mm -hmm. other countries, it's here in the United States. Yeah. You know, and so mm -hmm. this, so the gap between people who menstruate and people who don't, mm -hmm. but among the people who menstruate, there are people who have easy access to right. the products and people who have limited access or no access. Right. And this causes this, this inequity mm -hmm. among people because women from about 11 to let's say 50 have to manage this right. once a month right it's not an option right exactly I mean we're we see girls in um, local schools who report that 30 percent they have missed at least um, one day last year due to their period and that was about 30 percent of students reported that and you did a very interesting survey because mm -hmm. you've actually got dispensers in a middle school and high school in Manassas Park mm -hmm. City schools exactly but you did the survey and that yeah. really was kind of it was amazing the response right. and how many girls had missed class time. Exactly, and, and, and think about um, the toll that must take on them, the lack of education that they are that they are experiencing versus someone who doesn't menstruate just stays in class and you know continues his work. So some of the yeah. questions I, I, if I remember correctly, that you asked is how many times they'd called a parent mm -hmm. to pick them up or bring them clothes. Right. You know how many how many times they'd had to leave class to go and find from the nurse. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, uh -huh. a pad or a tampon. Right, and that has an economic impact because if parents are leaving work to have to bring new clothes to their kids or just to pick them up to go home, then they're losing time at their job. So one of the, the pieces of legislation, we're going to talk more later yeah. in the show right. about some of the legislation here in Virginia. Uh -huh. Some of it's successful, still some a work in progress. One of the things you wanted to see was public schools putting mm -hmm. these dispensers into restrooms yes. so that girls had free access. Right. To right. these products. I mean, it's just common sense. I mean, it's it's it, it's a there's a problem. Absenteeism is an issue. Academic performance is an issue, especially for low income students. Um, Fairfax County alone has 30 percent students on free and reduced lunch uh, meals, and so that's so that about 30 percent of Fairfax County population, one of the richest counties in the country once a month is is really trying to find ways to manage their menstruation on a very low budget they may not want to burden their parents they may not want to um, they may not want to ex have to walk to the clinic in front of other students well we you know? were just talking you yeah. know the fact that culturally girls have kind of i don't know embrace this idea that you don't talk about your period yes you you, you know girls in the bathroom who who, who are wonder about the paper yep. giving away the fact that you know this stigma yes. around this very normal bodily process mm -hmm. is kind of perplexing especially in this yeah. day and age right but as a mother i'm trying to think what you know my my girls are in their 30s now right i mean i don't know what their experience was right. but your daughter's having a very different experience yeah you know my daughter and i i mean she might I've been doing this for about four years now, and you know she has been exposed to 
everything, tampon and pad. And so it's something that we talk about very openly in our home. Um, she does not, she has not grown with, up with the being a stigma. In fact, when other kids in her class get their period for the first time, she comes home and it, excited and celebrates the fact that they have it. And, and um, but I, that is not how I grew up. And I would say that's not how the that's majority of people I grew, up. grew up as well. I, I mean, I, I've spoken to a lot of groups about this and the majority of our discussion is centered around the fact that their first period was horrific. Um, and so, lots of shame, lots of angry feelings. And, and I think it just still sticks with them to the day where, you know, if they're, you know, 50 and they get their period, like, how am I going to go access my product? How do I sneak out of this meeting to go take care of my menstrual needs? Like, I don't have a product with me. Now I've got to leave work and go find something because most office buildings do not uh, stock the bathrooms with, with um, menstrual supplies. Public facilities do not stock bathrooms with menstrual supplies. So what do you do? You get your period, what do you do? And you need to continue with your day. So it's interesting because Bras, which you founded, mm -hmm. I think back in 2015, mm -hmm. and it says bringing, it's bringing resources and aid to women's shelters. Right. But it's gone way beyond this first goal of yours, which right. was to give products uh -huh. to women in shelters that didn't have them. Right. But now it's expanded to policy work, right. it's expanded to schools, and you've even, you've got a partnership with Vienna Community mm -hmm. Center. Right. Right. I mean, the initial goal was to make sure that women who are homeless have the products they need, and we still do that, and we do it really, we do it really well right now. Uh, we get items that are collected from the community every month. We take those items, we box them up, and we bring them to about 45 different shelters. We actually don't even have to spend any money on the products because we get so many items donated a month from book clubs, uh, church groups, you know, and so they're we're taking care of that right now. Um, we also, but we we're only touching the surface with school. There are so, until every girl has access to these products, we haven't done our job. Every girl who needs access, but the problem is, a lot of times they themselves are not a self advocates. They don't ask for it because it's a stigma. There's an issue, and so they'll just continue to miss school. So finding the people who can identify these needs is part of our challenge. And then finally, in public facilities, we were able to partner with the town of Vienna who I um, greatly appreciate letting us um, pilot the program. And we placed them in two, two machines in the community center and one on the town green. It's like right near a trail, so people are biking. And the idea is if kids are doing after school programs, they can continue <laughs> to do their program without having to stop and go home. Um, and same thing, you're riding, you're walking, and you get your period, go to the bathroom, take care of your needs, and continue on. There's no reason they don't have the same freedom and opportunities as people who do not menstruate. Absolutely. And we you know once upon a time, we also didn't have soap and toilet paper right. mandated in public bathrooms because years ago people used, you know, outhouses. Yeah. And then suddenly there were public indoor facilities and people said well if you're going to provide toilet facilities right. then you should pro provide toilet paper and right. soap for hygienic reasons exactly and, and the expectation is that we're not bringing our own toilet paper and soap wherever we go i mean there are things that have just become commonplace in public buildings we go to restaurants and we get straws you know straws are hot, hot in, a hot topic right now in the news right. but like why is it why are straws provided in restaurants and pads and tampons aren't why are napkins provided mm -hmm. like why is it that these things are just expected yet these products are not and i mean i would argue it's because we're women we're <laughs> women and there's a stigma and yes and people grown women are stigmatized even mm -hmm. advocating for this themselves exactly. right exactly you know i remember one of the hearings a young girl spoke in front of a committee hearing and the woman who came after her said that she was just in awe of the fact that she was more comfortable speaking about right. these issues than she was right i mean we we intentionally built a teen council um with bras that works very hard at um, the, working at, at destigmatizing these issues, um, you know, trying to raise awareness. They do collection drives, they fundraise, they go to the shelters and, and, and do it. And we take pictures and we highlight that, that this is not something to be embarrassed or shamed of. It's something that is super normal. And in order for people to proceed with their day, they need uh, products to manage their period. And they need them when they need them. And they need them when and, you they know, need and people them. who don't menstruate maybe don't know that you can't always predict. In fact, right. generally you don't predict yes. when you're going to get your period. Mm -hmm. And therefore, wherever you are and you get it, yeah. you may or may not have something right there with you. Right. Right. We don't I mean there's there's such a lack of access. It's it's insane. It's ridiculous. It's just something that 
has been overlooked for too, too long. And so tell me the importance of men getting involved in this. And we'll yeah. talk a little bit later about Mark Keem, Delegate Mark right. Keem, who is your delegate. Yes. And how he has stepped up in a very enthusiastic way. Uh -huh. He's become a champion for this issue, even among the Boy Scouts, apparently. Yeah, right. But we have other allies in, as well. And, and Ben Tribbett and Adam Parkamanko mm -hmm. have actually put up a tree in their office space yeah. in Fairfax City. Right. And I think they're calling it the... The tampon tree. The it's tampon decorated tree. decorated with tampons. And absolutely. And so Adam and Ben have made it a collection site mm -hmm. for products. So all around the base of the Christmas tree yes. are products that you will then use to do direct services exactly. to people who need them. Yes, I think I mentioned earlier that we rely heavily on the community to provide pads and tampons and undergarments as well um, to the shelters. And so so for the holiday season, uh, uh, TR Group decided that instead of doing a, diff a clothing drive, which is more common, nothing right. wrong with that, but it's just something that you see a lot more. Um, they decided instead that they're going to do a collection drive for something that is often not donated. And you know, pads, but, tampons. But let's face it, I think it's also kind of an unexpected thing that two men yes. who own their own firm yes. would decide that this is the thing that they want to collect right. and this is the thing that right. I, I think, and I hope, and I don't know how you feel about mm -hmm. it, but I do think that men have to be our allies in this. Totally. We can't do this alone. I mean, unfortunately, men are still the majority of people making the laws and public policy. I mean, it's changing, um, but at this time, that's who is in charge of our decision making. So men need to be uh, men need to understand that this is a community issue. This is not just a woman only issue. It's, it has become that. It, it's always been that way, but it's an issue that affects our economy, our education, um, and men need to be involved in making that change. They need to be raising the awareness, and they need to be part of the conversation. And so, yes, I love the fact that this this firm that's owned by two men and the staff is all men um, <laughs> um, are able to embrace um, a topic that I'm sure is very much outside their comfort zone. Absolutely and it's mm -hmm. open to the public so yes. 4010 University Drive in Fairfax City and if you yeah. want to see the tampon tree or you want to take a, a pack of pads mm -hmm. or tampons then you can put it under the tree and it will be distributed obviously to somebody who needs it. Yes exactly. And I think we will hear more too from Delegate Mark Keem as he goes about spreading the word, as you said, yeah. to Boy Scouts. And I think until men can talk with confidence and right. surety um, and comfortably about this, the culture isn't going to change. Exactly. So when we come back from this break, we are going to be talking further with Holly Siebold and also um, Karana Shaheen. I got that wrong. Anyway, <laughs> back after the break. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again. Mm -hmm. And now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. responsibility oh it's huge I know it's huge yeah, and the salary oh my god yes I right? mean like I was literally I was about to move in with my parents and <laughs> right before the, yeah so this saved me I, I really believe in you you know thank you it's nice to hear that from someone <laughs> these are cool did you um what did you
We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and joining me in this segment are Shaheen Kurana of the Virginia Menstrual Equity Coalition and Holly Siebold. Thank you for being here, Shaheen. So you have been working on something very specific, a piece of legislation that passed this year. It was like the only piece of legislation in our menstrual equity menu yeah. that actually passed. It was Kay Corey's bill, and it's we refer to it as HB 83. So catch our viewers up on exactly what that bill is. Okay, so HB 83 is uh, basically a bill that was introduced to provide free menstrual products to all female inmates. Um, uh, upon request. So uh, this was approved in, uh, in July, the 1st of July, 2018. And since then, and what it specifically said that uh, it, it, it directed the uh, Department of uh, Corrections, the Director of the Department of Corrections and the Board of Corrections to specifically um, implement, uh, adopt and implement a standard or procedure that would um, allow for menstrual products to be um, uh, included in their minimum standard for jails and prisons. So I think one of the things that brought was brought to our attention is that, that Bras works with Friends of Guest House, and this is a reentry mm -hmm. program for women returning to the community who have been previously incarcerated. And this is where we found out that access to these products is it's it's ran it's random in the sense that it's up to a guard. Mm -hmm. They're pads. If you want tampons, you have to purchase them in the commissary, which a lot of these That's women correct. have no yeah. money and right. no access to money, so they don't have access to this. And so these stories were coming out of these jails and prisons, saying, you know, we don't have adequate products to manage something that happens like every 28 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in addition, the cost is also high, even in, for the purchase perspective. It's very high, and the quality is also very inconsistent. You know, sometimes they would give you just panty liners and then pass them off as pads. So. Right, and of course, we have to acknowledge that the bulk of people making policies and the bulk of people running mm -hmm. our Department of Corrections are people who don't menstruate. Right, right. They don't, and so it's kind of like it's kind of like here's a pad or here's three pads for the rest of the week. Should be fine. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. some of it yeah. just made no sense, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't make sense if you never had to manage it yourself. Right. So right. you know, questions about the types of products or the quality of products, the people making the decisions about those things were not people who generally have ever had a need to use them. Right. 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 So Delegate K. Corey carried this bill. It was signed into law by the governor. Right. But now they're explain to us about the comment period that is certainly out right. online. Uh, so the way it goes uh, with HB 83, once it was uh, went into effect, what that actually meant was that the the minimum standard still had to be uh, had the the language for menstrual products still had to be added to the minimum standard for jails and lo lockups, and that had to be amended. So that was um, actually uh, put in place right now. Uh, the language uh, we are as part of the HB 83 Accountability Committee. We, we sort of approved the language that went into it uh, and we made sure that we included pads and tampons and uh, you know that it was always going to be available upon request. Um, and uh, right now, all, it's passed through all of the agency, uh, you know, reviews. Uh, the governor has actually approved it, and it's now going through a comment period. So, so the people want to go and say that they support this as a really good idea. Mm -hmm. They can go out to the, it's a, it's a regulatory site, it's a government site. I think we're going to put the, right. yeah. the, the link up that says that you can go and basically say, as a citizen, mm -hmm. I think this is a great idea. It's townhall.virginia.gov, okay. right? And then everybody, so that's what we've been encouraging everybody to go out and post their strong support for this uh, bill. We've actually posted it in our Virginia Menstrual Equity Coalition Facebook page. We've asked our uh, HB83 Accountability Committee members to go in and comment. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, we want to show our strong support of it. So if, it, if there is no objections, in fact, I, I looked at the comments and they all look positive to me right now. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. this will actually take effect officially January 1st, is that correct? It's actually January 10th. January 10th. Right. So then this will be the standard for all jails and prisons. But but the whole idea of this accountability committee has mm -hmm. been so you've got it so you've got a regulation. 
Right. How do we make sure that that filters down to the people at these actual facilities to make sure that these women are getting these products? Right, so we want to make sure that it's it's uh, consistently and uniformly applied to all jails and prisons, right? Um, and, and so what we try to do as part of this is is make sure that we uh, uh, we try to find out all the inst all the nonprofits and all the church uh, or the religious organizations that are working with these uh, jails and prisons. So uh, trying to get try to recruit them as allies in um, in trying to get some real time feedback. Right. Um, There's a lot about. of prison ministries for all kinds right. of things. Mm -hmm. So this this is a good idea. It's like you're already there. So uh -huh. find out for yeah. us. Ask the question. Are you getting these products in a timely fashion? Right. Because again, you're asking. It's not just the availability of the products. You're asking guards and administrators to do something differently than the way they've always done it up to this point. Correct, yeah. Um, and it's uh, basically, it used to be, there used to be language in the minimum jails and prison, uh, um, uh, and what it was, it, it used to say reasonable request. Right. So we had the reasonable piece of it removed. So it, upon request, it's supposed to be uh, provided. And of course, tampons was never part of the, the whole equation. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to sort of understand uh, what kind of, what's the quality of the products that are going to be uh, provided. Also, what the ordering cycles are. So yes, I mean, we, we, we know it's going, it's supposed to be effective 10-1, um, January uh, 10th, but we really don't know when, what the ordering cycles are going to be. When it will actually, when actually down to a Exactly. So that's what some of these allies that we have and, you know, some real-time feedback on whether we're actually going to, they're actually seeing the effect of these, um, uh, of this, of this standard. And I believe, too, the Delegate Kay Corey also is visiting the facilities. And she's gone around to different parts of the state and mm -hmm. she's asked the question. I think that's important to basically show up and say, in case you weren't aware, we have a bill in place and this is what it says and like what is going to be your process and system because I think it comes down to processes and systems. Right, and she's been a great advocate for trying to make sure that, you know, all of this is moving forward and uh, trying to get some of that early feedback about what the quality is going to be and, you know, what the ordering cycle is. Uh, so she's uh, she's been great and, of course, uh, part of our uh, committees, you know, we have uh, v various uh, women uh, advocates Right, uh, from across the state. For, uh, basically, uh, grassroots organizations, right. the ACLU, um, you know, prison reform advocates. So we're all part of this committee. So hopefully uh, the idea is if we, we hear of issues, then we can sort of address them. So speaking of issues, Holly, we, we heard of an mm -hmm. issue, you heard of an issue, of somebody visiting mm -hmm. a prison who discovered when she arrived and went through a body scan that she was asked if she was on her period. Right, right. What happened there? Right, well, actually to, to, to backtrack a little bit, um, there was a bit of a media uh, storm uh, of a couple months ago because the Department of Corrections issued a order to, to a policy to no longer allow women um, who are visiting to wear tampons or menstrual cups. And this was something that our legislators jumped on and said, this is not acceptable. Brian Moran got the, um, the Secretary of Public Health and Safety, um, got <laughs> many calls. Mm -hmm. um, and so what had happened was that he ended up um, stopping it, temporarily stopping the order for now. Um, but in, while that was happening, uh, someone had reached out to me who a couple months ago had visited a, a family member mm -hmm. in prison and um, was confused because she's because this this new policy was supposed to take effect next month and she's like but the policy exists already and right. so that's why she wanted to talk about it um, and and you know she confidentiality is I, you know right I don't want to reveal too much information but um, she said that when she went through the scanner they identified that she was wearing a tampon and after they after she identified that um, they the guards took her into a separate room and said that she needs to put on a government issued tampon and needs to do it in front of the guards um, she refused to do it and had to leave and go home and she drove there she drove about three hours to go mm. visit her loved one and never even got to see that person, which was a shame because the loved one was also inside waiting 
right. to see. Right. And so that's, you that's, know, that, that is a, a major problem, mainly mm -hmm. for two reasons. Right. You know, the, 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 the policy was going to take effect, and so this letter, and someone got a, I don't remember who gave us the letter. Somebody got right. the letter and knew that this policy was taking effect. But this woman who reached out to you confirmed the fact that the policy was already in place. Yes. What they were basically doing was codifying something they were already doing exactly. without yeah. a policy to back it up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They were just doing it. And, um, and so and getting away with it, right? For, for right. A while. And with, so you know, it seems almost that the new policy was going to be a solution for a problem um, that they that was happening. So at least people before they drove down um, to you know a prison uh, would know that they can't be wearing tampons or they're not going to be able to get in to right. see somebody that day. So I guess in a way it was trying to like put it. On, document it so right. that it's something that people know ahead of time. But the bigger question is, is this even a major problem anyway? Like, how many people are actually smuggling drugs through and that And that's tampons? exactly the case they've tried to make. So in the <laughs> Richmond Times-Dispatch, twice, they did an article. One woman apparently was caught with contraband, mm -hmm. but in this article they kept talking about the number of drug overdose dose, mm -hmm. uh, opioid deaths. Opioid deaths. Yeah, yeah. Uh, opioid yeah. deaths in prison. As if the two were related. Mm -hmm. right? And you know, it's like, I'm going to tell you this fact, and then I'm going to tell you this fact, and you're going to assume that these two facts are related. Right. Mm -hmm. But as we all know, Visitors have a full body cavity search right. after they've had a visitor. Yep. And therefore, if there are drug overdoses in prisons, we can assume that it's probably not coming through tampon wearing women. Right. It's probably coming through guards and, um, and vendors right. and employees of the prison. So, my question in this context is why aren't we talking about drug sniffing dogs? Right. Because clearly, yeah. if all you're doing to combat drug smuggling in prisons, is telling women they can't wear tampons, yes. that doesn't seem to be mm -hmm. solving the problem they claim exists. Right. right. Plus, in addition, a family visiting is a support system for you know the uh, the inmates. And anything that you do in these kinds of things discourage the visitors from coming in. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of like disconnecting some of the support systems that they need, um, which is both bad for the family as well as the inmates. And of course, know. disproportionately affects women, which right. is what this whole show is about. It's the fact that why are po the policing of women's bodies mm -hmm. coming to thank you, Shaheen, thank you. for being on here and the great work you're doing on HP83. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Join us in the next segment. We are going to be talking to Delegate Jennifer Boisco. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I surrender, I surrender. All right, pal. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Do we have a gun? What's that? Do we have a gun? Hmm. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase? Cleverly merging promotions. I love it cross-referencing travel sites, and booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh, But now they're like... Yeah. Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Last night at high school... I tried Oxy at a couple of parties. I thought I had it under control. I didn't know it'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. <sighs> Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. What to expect when you're expecting? Like you? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to team-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. Preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the- Mom, you don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Yeah. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. And we're talking about menstrual equity. And joining me in this segment, along with Holly Siebold, is Delegate Jennifer Boisco. 
Thank you so much for being here, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me, Catherine. It's good to be here. So you have been very active. We've been talking a lot about tampons, but we're going to pivot a little bit and we're going to talk about dignity. Yeah. Right? Let's talk about dignity in relationship to how we're trying to create policies that support women in managing this thing that happens to us every 28 days. I'm going to say 28 days. <laughs> okay. Sure. So we, uh, you know, Holly and I have talked over the past few years, and we were we were discussing the the menstrual equity, and 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 thought about well how how best to phrase this because this isn't really about tampons and pads. Right. It's really about treating women with dignity and allowing them to have the ability to take care of their needs without humiliating them, without um, um, embarrassing embarrassing them. them. Mm -hmm. But also, it's, a, it's an equity issue as far as the taxes. So I, I with, with Holly's collaboration, created a, a bill, we called it the Dignity Act. It would remove the sales tax on tampons and pads and other menstrual products. Um, because it's, you know, as, as we have discussed, it's something that happens to all women and... Uh, For decades and decades. Yes. Like, it's a lot of money. And I don't know if you realize this, though, um, in Virginia, um, we have a sales tax holiday to help you right. go back to school. You can buy a wedding dress. You can buy garters and stockings tax-free. You can um, buy all kinds of things, but you can't buy tampons or pads. And then when we uh, look at the sales tax, just in a general sales tax, um, you can buy dandruff shampoo, um, candy. candy without tax but menstrual supplies are taxed. And so the concept behind that, we had two different bills. One would just remove the tax on that back to school weekend, um, which was not even given a hearing last year. And then the other was just to completely remove the tax completely. Uh, we had a $4 million, uh, but it would have been a $4 billion million dollar budget item and the governor was in support of it. He actually, in the hearing, sent the, the Secretary of, of, um, Re of Revenue in to, to support the bill, and um, it, it ended up in this huge shenanigans. Yes, yes it did. I and mean, right down to the naming of the bill. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it was. It, two years in a row, they stripped the name of the bill out to remove the dignity. Of the Dignity Act. Of the <laughs> Dignity Act, and then killed it. But last year, um, we had a huge group of, gr of grassroots supporters. So mm -hmm. Holly and um, probably 50 other people yes. were there in the room with their social media. Mm -hmm. Social media has really changed things, I think. Yes. Um, and we waited for, th I think it was two to three hours, and then they decided that they'd run out of time um, mm -hmm. claiming that there was a special rule a on, rule Fridays on something, Fridays. Something. It's, the, it's the 10 o'clock rule and we have to stop the, we have to stop this. And so um, they, they just emptied the room immediately and then Holly and all of the supporters, groundswell of support yes. from all over the region, mm -hmm. all over the Commonwealth, uh, followed back up with all of the members of the committee and, and basically demanded that the bill get a hearing. So you had gotten up at like seven o'clock in the morning, as I or earlier, earlier than that, earlier. with mm -hmm. your children. Right, yes. we left the house at four a.m. Skipped school that day um, because I wanted to, my children to see democracy at work. Because <laughs> that was one of the things I was arguing with the committee. Is like, how can you do this in front of children? Like, yeah. allow the bill to be heard at least. So that's not how our government should operate. Um, yeah, and we sat through my poor kids sat through all through um, hours and hours yep. of of bills being heard and then they refused to hear it. But the thing that I think was different than years past was that we were live streaming it. And so many people were very excited. They woke up early as well to, to see watch it. Yep, I was watching hearing. it. I was exactly. totally watching it. And um, it was over before they had the opportunity to actually hear our case. Um, and so I think that that also, because of the live stream, it got people excited. Yeah, I think so mm -hmm. too. And so, so it was not, that was not the end of the story, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> because, yeah. because something, all that, that kerfuffle and the people who were watching it live streamed, mm -hmm. there was a major backlash and that was on a Friday. Uh -huh. That's right. Right. And so by um, Tuesday, I think Monday, Monday or Tuesday, the, there was a special hearing that just, was scheduled. Just for the bill. Just for this one bill. bill. And, um, but the unfortunate part was, I, 
in my opinion, it, it, it killed time because it was right before uh, crossover, and so it never made it into appropriations. And so crossover, for anybody who's not right. familiar, okay. is uh, all the bills in the House are heard, and then once they're heard, then they have to go to the Senate. There's a drop-dead right time. And so if it doesn't get considered, then it's over and right. no longer able to be considered in the Senate. Right. By stalling, it, 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 it hurt our efforts to get it to the Senate. Yeah, right. And so when that happened, when it stalled the efforts to get mm -hmm. it to the Senate, mm -hmm. that basically meant that it was dead for that whole year. Mm -hmm. so, right. so basically what we have to do now in mm -hmm. this 2019 legislative session, right. and this is where it gets very interesting, I think particularly for Jennifer, right. is what Jennifer's role might be in this yeah. upcoming 2019 right. Uh, legislative session, right? Right, because you know she has been working uh, in the House, yes, on these bills since 2015 when she was elected to the House. Mm -hmm. Right, but right. but there's a possibility that you might have a new role, and we're going to find that out January 8th. That's right. So I have a special election. You know, Jennifer Wexton, State Senator Jennifer Wexton, has been elected to Congress. I'm the only member of the House of Delegates that lives in her district, and I am running to replace her in the, in the 33rd State Senate District, and that will be. January the eighth, um, right? And so, election. right? And so, you, we're, what we're hoping is to see you move from the House to the Senate, where again you have the. And let's talk about companion bills, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, a House could start in the House, but a, a bill can also start in the Senate, that's and that's right. the whole point of crossover. Mm -hmm. Is then the bills cross over before they're passed? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So, and it'll be the first time it'll, it, it will be introduced in the Senate because every bill that We've has never. been, yeah, every menstrual equity bill that has been introduced has come first from, from the, the House. house. Right. So that's great. So and that's, we, been, that's mm -hmm. been you, that's been Mark Keem, that's mm -hmm. been Kay Corey. Mm -hmm. And the three of us were actually on a menstrual equity panel in, in New Orleans, Louisiana. We certainly were. We were. Netroots Nation. We were at okay. Netroots Nation. And that was, a, you know, that was something new for Netroots. They had never had anyone come yeah. and speak about this. And there was a lot of mm -hmm. interest. There was yeah. a lot of Before interest. Before and after, there was a lot of interest. So it tells me that, that the nation is ready to have a different conversation. Mm -hmm. I think. Virginia is ready to have a different conversation. So what do you see are our opportunities in 2019? Well, I, you know, we're going we're gonna to reintroduce it again. Um, with the, the bill for the prison the, that you all were just talking about, right. that, that was the first time Virginia had ever considered and passed any sort of proactive menstrual equity legislation. This shouldn't be a partisan issue. This right. should be something that we can all get mm -hmm. behind. Um, with the governor being supportive of it, I think we can find the revenue source. And um, I'm just excited at the opportunity for it. I also agree that we need to do something about our schools, and, mm -hmm. and, and Mark Keem was great and sponsored that bill. I co-sponsored it. Right. Um, I think we need to just, again, think through how we're going to pay for it, find those, mm -hmm. those revenues. Um, in a time where, you know, the budget is tight. Mm -hmm. But this should be a priority and it should be a no-brainer. There are other things that um, receive uh, tax relief that do not affect as many people as do um, these these issues. I, I absolutely agree, but I think some of it's cultural too. I mean, other states have actually passed some yes. of these bills. D.C. Mm -hmm. has passed a bill that removed the tax from these products. Other, mm -hmm. you know, New York City has provided these yep. products in their public schools. And so have California and Illinois. Mm -hmm. they, the state has required that every school district provide dispensers and tampons and pads to girls in grades 6th through 12th grade. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's becoming a nationwide effort. Fifteen states have removed the, the, the tax on um, tampons and pads, and, and, you know, Jennifer's been working on this for years. It's time for Virginia to do the same. Yeah, and one, one thing that I found has been really interesting is we've actually gotten a lot of national press on this over the past few years. There is a big interest all across the nation. This is something, you know, President Obama was even talking about it when he was still in office, that he, he'd never really considered these issues because it didn't affect him personally. I think the more diverse membership of our legislatures and of the, the Congress that we have, the more likely we're going to have some success on these because putting people with, with different backgrounds and different experiences, they can bring that to the floor and discuss it in a way that helps other people connect and helps them to understand why it should be important to everyone. Well, you found colleagues in the House on your side of the mm -hmm. aisle that have supported this. Moving to the Senate, do you think that there's an opportunity for bipartisan bipartisanship? support 
because you know the Senate's a little bit different from the House, mm -hmm. and the people in it have done sort of amazing things sure. in their advocacy. Mm -hmm. I can think of a couple people off the top of my head who might actually get behind a bill like this. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, th I think it should be very reasonable. There's a there is a, a state senator who is an OBGYN, who obviously she should understand why this would make sense. But there are other people who I think that are common sense, reasonable, pragmatic folks who understand that um, that we shouldn't be taxing these these products, whether it's you know all year long or at a minimum during the back to school holiday. I, I just can't even understand how um, someone would say that you don't have to have these products to go to school if you're a girl. Yeah, right. When you're talking about right. school supplies, no. this is a school this tax is, holiday. Yeah, exactly. if you're a girl, yes. these will be in your backpack or I, in your purse when I, you go to school. You probably don't need a wedding dress or <laughs> garters and stockings. <laughs> yeah. You know. For your back to school yeah. holiday. Right. For your back to school holiday. So we'll see how it goes. I'm going to go in with a very positive attitude, looking to work across the aisle and help people to understand why this is important. This is something that can be a win-win for everybody and find some good common ground. So, And what is your uh, advice for activists and just ordinary people watching the show about the most effective way to push this forward? What should they do, Jennifer? Mm -hmm. Sure. I think the use of social media was yes. amazing last year, mm -hmm. and I really give Holly a lot of credit for that. Mm -hmm. I think continuing to have that conversation, building a groundswell of support for it so that they know that it's happening and they know that they're being watched, that always you know, keeps people, but, but in a friendly and respectful way. We wouldn't want anybody to threaten or to, you know, be. Right. But, but, but part of these bills, well, part of the problem or the challenge is these bills are killed in committee hearings. Mm -hmm. They're never even, if you took them to the floor, you'd probably find support you in would. the chamber. Quite often. For these bills. Mm -hmm. So you have a handful of people, you're talking about eight to 12 people mm -hmm. who have the opportunity to kill the bill. Right. So I think a lot of people don't understand that it's not about voting on the floor. You've got to get to it's the legislature. That your subcommittee legis or full committee is that's exactly where you've got to be. And so. that's why people were, in, were up in arms because they, this, the incident that happened was in subcommittee. So we were just asking for it to be heard, give it a chance to move past subcommittee. And, and it was not... We were not given that was opportunity. It's not honored yes, correctly. Exactly. Well, that nine o'clock. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that nine thing that happened meeting. at nine o'clock. <laughs> well, one, anyway. one of the two dates that people need to keep in mind: January eighth, mm -hmm. there is a special election yep. to put you in the Senate. Yes. But January 9th is the beginning of session. That's correct. The, and that is where people need to pay attention. It's a short session, forty-five days mm -hmm. this year. So I just want to remind our viewers that you need to get involved. You need yep. to know who your legislators are, your senator and your delegate. And on January 9th, you need to make your voice heard when it comes to this kind of public policy. Perfect. This is the story of a boy who was very sensitive to lights and sounds. Awesome sounds. So he built secret hiding places where nothing could get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. It made him feel uncomfortable. One day, he found out he had something called autism. His family got him help, and slowly, he learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on man, let's put a ride home. Being a dad is an adventure full of special moments. A crew? Surprise! Unexpected moments. I got this. Ugh and even awkward moments. Okay, Dad, thank you. <laughs> but every moment you spend with your kids, <laughs> even the smallest moments, <laughs> can make the biggest impact on your child's life. So take a moment to be a dad today. <laughs> so, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek.
We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and tonight we're talking about menstrual equity. This is an update show, and joining me on set is uh, Holly Siebold, who's the founder of Bras, and Karen Keys Gamara. Thank you so much for joining us, Karen Keys Gamara. She is a member of the Fairfax County School mm -hmm. Board and at large member. Thank you for having me. If this is your first time on the set. I yes. mean, I'm very cozy with a lot of the school board members, but this is our first time together. Right. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a follow-on motion that you recently made mm -hmm. that addresses this topic of the school's responsibility to provide these products for the children attending Fairfax County Public Schools. Well, I had the opportunity of running into this amazing woman, <laughs> Holly, oh, and she told me that she uh, have been trying to figure out how to get some things done within FCPS and my wheels just kind of started turning and uh, we were actually having dealing with our legislative agenda that Monday so over the weekend I talked to a few of my colleagues and tried to figure out how to get it done and Monday afternoon I submitted it I asked all my colleagues to forgive me for doing it so quickly but honestly Friday to Monday, I thought that was pretty efficient. Uh, yeah, <laughs> efficient that, yeah. use of time. Um, and so we were able to present uh, it as a part of the legislative agenda, which makes sense because mm -hmm. there's certain things that you can do at the county level, mm -hmm. but budgets are always like the biggest, I guess, the biggest hurdle that the board has to tackle every year is Absolutely. the funding mm -hmm. for the current and existing programs. Correct. So, and you get that from the County Board of Supervisors, but without funding from the state, this would be almost impossible for this school system to do on its own. Well, the, the, the follow-on motion was actually, is actually uh, accomplished two purposes. First of all, it said that the 10th largest school system in the nation, the largest school system in, in uh, the state of Virginia, actually cares about this issue. And so we were able to send a message to the legislature, and in sending our legislative packet, this is included, that Fairfax County is concerned about uh, how our uh, folks who need menstrual products uh, are able to participate in our schools and that impacts a lot of issues as Holly I think mm -hmm. may have brought some information about absenteeism oh, right. how um, you know how people don't want to go to school sometimes and they don't have those products and and there can be embarrassment just a number of problems and that's really uh, it's really timely because the standards for accreditation have been changed and absenteeism is one of the things that's considered for accreditation. So I just felt that it wow. was really <laughs> important that we recognize the connection. It really is an equity issue. Um, and so therefore I was really excited to be able to figure it out in such a short amount of time with the help of a few of my friends. Right, well you know, and, and Holly's done a great job in finding, mm -hmm. you know, Fairfax County Public Schools is massive, mm -hmm. and it's hard to do a pilot program yes. within a massive system, which is why doing it with the Mass Manassas Park City Schools, it's, they just have one middle school and one high school, right. but right. collecting the data, because I think this is something that the legislators are also asking for, is the data. Mm -hmm. Correct. What is the usage, and what is the cost, and what is the fiscal impact for any legislation that we pass? Right, and so that's the other important part piece of this, is that the uh, follow-on motion directed the superintendent to have staff look at this issue to see what it would take to be able to provide those products and so now we'll be having meetings we'll look at the cost we'll look at what schools we can start in and we the broad overall request is to look at FCPS but if we have to narrow it down we would look at our some of our high poverty school. You know, and that's interesting because Esther from McLean has a question about that. She wants to know whether um, we're, we're talking about products for everybody or just students that are like on the free and reduced meal program. I mean, are you talking about just for specific students having access or are you talking about trying to push for something that would be available to all students? Well, at this point we're looking at both of those options. I mean, it could be that it's terribly expensive and we, we, get very, we don't get a lot of money from the state as it is. Right. Um, and so we, re I, the, the, I'm sorry, the follow-on motion gives the staff that flexibility. They can bring proposals to us to figure out what we can actually accomplish. And is that something as a direct service organization that BRAS mm -hmm. can be involved in? I mean, mm -hmm. you're already mm -hmm. doing some of that delivery to certain students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we deliver uh, about 
500 uh, pads and tampons a month to students in Fairfax County Public Schools. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we spend a good deal of money. We buy at retail, you mm -hmm. know, so we're not getting necessarily. And it's same. being taxed, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> buying at retail and it's being taxed. Uh, yeah, well, that we won't out. even talk yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, coming from the county, they have, they can be purchasing wholesale. They can mm -hmm. be, um, mm -hmm. and they also can be meeting more, the, they can be meeting and addressing all the students who are in need. We're relying heavily on parent liaisons, counselors, social workers who take notice. They say, well, oh, this child is missing school. They investigate and they figure out the reason why is because she has her period. Bra steps in, we provide the pads. The difference here would be the pads would be available in the school, like in right. the bathrooms, mm -hmm. right. even more so, because the clinic is not a sufficient um, place to keep them because the girls still are missing class as they make their way to the clinic. And many, when they get to the clinic, if they see boys, they will not go in. Mm -hmm. And so instead, they turn around and go to the office and call and ask to go home, which mm -hmm. talk, talk, speaks to your the attendance rate and the academic performance for students who are missing so much class. Right. You know, so having them in the in the bathroom allows. Uh, children to go in, get them, manage their needs, and get back to class so they can learn. Right, right. I mean, yeah. and this kind of brings up the One Fairfax Initiative. I mean, right. we just passed that. The, the county passed it. The school uh, also signed on that. We're really trying to remove any obstacles mm -hmm. to opportunity. And I see this uh, follow-on motion as a part of that. Absolutely, because because in a very wealthy county, and everybody knows that there yeah. are pockets of high poverty. Right. Absolutely, and sometimes we can identify that through you know schools that are considered Title One. But somebody pointed out the other day to me that there is a lot of there are many students with high need that are in schools that are not Title One. That's true. So benefits that are given to a school that's in a high poverty district mm -hmm. doesn't address the the pockets of kids a dozen kids in a school where they are you know on a free and reduced lunch plan but the school is not considered to be in a high poverty area correct you can't always identify based on the street you're on we don't know what our neighbors are going through mm -hmm. and so we really want to create this i call our schools the statue of liberty of, of education we come one come all and, and everybody should be able to have, you know, their educational needs. It should be a caring culture. And we certainly don't want someone staying at home because of, a, you know, a bodily function. Or I know, know, but, you know, this is kind of interesting. And I know that through our FLE program, and we do so are sort of age-appropriate mm -hmm. lessons mm -hmm. for children all the way through their public school education, and we're always adding things to that. Uh, Eileen Fillercorn, you know, famously and wonderfully added consent, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that that need to be addressed. Yes. But, mm -hmm. but we are not necessarily destigmatizing this for both boys and girls. Mm -hmm. You know, I think girls are told about periods. I don't know how much boys are told about it. So you still have this dichotomy between girls hiding and feeling that it's shameful and embarrassing oh, absolutely. and it's secret from the boys. And I'm not sure that that some of this just isn't a cultural thing. And we need to look at the how we educate children of both genders as to what this is. Well, some of this is maturity, mm -hmm. you right. know. And so we prov hope to provide as much information as we can and, and t teach our kids to be kind and we have responsive classrooms and we're teaching, you know, it's a part, a part of the initiative this year, teaching each person to be responsible about how they speak to one another. Imagine putting yourself in that other person's uh, place. And so it is a process, you know, as a mother of boys, I understand it, it's, it's a journey. <laughs> you're right, you're right. You've got one of each and I've got both sets too. And But you know, I, I do think that, you know, adults are in a position where we're making policy decisions and I think young people are pr far more accepting of other people oh, different from themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're just, and so I, it seems to me that we need to like capitalize on this fact that this is a different generation. And oh, they're absolutely. far more open and accepting. You know, one of the things when um, uh, Holly had some, I think it was the on Capitol Hill and one mm -hmm. of your young, she was like 12 or 13. Yeah, right. oh. And she was talking about going to the nurse's office and you had to ask for a penguin or a turtle. Oh. Because they didn't want them to say pad and tampon out loud. And I'm like, oh, if, wow. you've got, if you've got school administrators telling, telling you to you. say euphemisms like mm -hmm. penguin and turtle, is that how, I'm just not sure. <laughs> That's I'm just not sure. I'm just I'll not sure. Have to well, look I just a think, little further into <laughs> that. I, but you know, I just think people bring their own thing. Sure. Right. I right. mean, people bring their own thing, and so 
you know, it, it, teachers, I don't know how teachers respond and maybe, you know, that's mm -hmm. just something we haven't discussed mm -hmm. with teachers either. Right. Is, you know, how do you address or kind of um, alleviate some of the fear? I think, you know, part of it too, we talk about middle schools mm -hmm. and high schools, but some girls get their periods very young. They do. And they're in elementary school. They are. Right. And mm -hmm. that's, we're not even talking about what happens to those girls. I was one of those girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was one of those girls. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. when you are the only one mm -hmm. and you're in fifth grade, it's kind of like, and I can remember that. You talked about that earlier, right. Holly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People, it, women remember their own yes. stories, yeah. their yes. own yes. experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And how shameful and embarrassed they were. I mean, there's a, there's a teacher at my daughter's school who's a specialist who um, has a policy that she doesn't allow kids to go to the bathroom because she's a specialist and she only sees them once a week. Um, and I took issue with that because you, there are sixth graders and fifth graders and fourth graders who have their periods. And to, and to not allow them to go and manage their period is something that um, should not be tolerated. And this right. isn't a Fairfax County Public School. You know, so a lot of that, again, like it had probably never even occurred to her or the principal that maybe a child needs to leave to manage their period. And so again, it's changing that stigma in addition to having the products readily available and accessible um, without having to ask for permission and, and, and missing class. But that's the importance yeah. of uh, parent advocates, right? right? Because oftentimes, depending on your experience, right. you're not thinking of mm -hmm. that this could impact another person. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes just making that statement helps right. that staff member to understand, oh, I didn't understand I was having that impact. Right, right. You know, it's like the Maslow's hierarchy need. Like if their needs are not being addressed, I can't imagine a lot of learning is going on at that particular moment. Right. You right. know, they're more worried about and filled with anxiety of like, am I staying in the chair? Or, like. Are my pants going to be ruined? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, especially if they're low income, that could be one of a very few pairs of pants they own. You know, right. and that could all be going through their mind while they're trying to learn in class. And I can't imagine that that's a priority at that point. But I really see this as an opportunity mm -hmm. for everybody to benefit, right? Like you said, mm -hmm. we're helping young men to understand. We're helping future fathers, future mm -hmm. mothers, uh, family members, staff members to understand what it takes to create a caring culture. I think you're right, and mm -hmm. I, you know, to me, Fairfax County has always been a leader. I'm very proud of our school board. I'm very proud of our county. I'm very proud of Holly <laughs> for being so bold, me too. <laughs> right? So bold I'm that we can yeah. march forward and talk about menstrual equity. Now, this yes. may not be something everybody discusses at their holiday dinner table. <laughs> Maybe not. My table. I know. We'll be at holiday. <laughs> Her table for sure. <laughs> for sure, they'll be discussing it. But yeah. I just want to thank you, Karen. I want to thank, thank you, Holly. Yes, thank you. And both. I want to remind people at home that this is an issue all of us. Care, should care about and get involved and help policymakers make good policy. <laughs>